In this day and age, few people in the United States seem to appreciate the wondrous ways in which this country has been blessed. There are those who sadly embrace a pathological view that sees the country as being founded on greed and the exploitation of others. To say that one is proud of the country's founding in some social and political circles is like throwing holy water on a group of vampires. Nonetheless, it's important to appreciate the obstacles that our ancestors faced. They believed that the hand of God made it possible for them to survive. They were thankful for their blessings, but sadly many of us today have little gratitude for what we have inherited. In honor of that great sacrifice that our ancestors made, today on the Vantage Point we're going to take a brief look at the miracles of Thanksgiving. I hope you'll join me. Imagine that we are living in a period of time that we now call the Little Ice Age. Winters were much longer and colder than they are today. England's River Thames routinely froze in the 17th century. While this frozen state allowed the ladies and lords of Westminster to indulge their passion for skating, the poor had to contend with restricted growing seasons and biting and frequently killing cold. You might note that nowadays the River Thames rarely freezes. The growing season in the 17th century was much shorter than it is today, so the closer one's existence was to the land, the more precarious was survival. In the north of Great Britain, the restricted growing season caused by the Little Ice Age made it difficult for England and Scotland to feed their populations. So many peasants took advantage of King James's plantation of Ulster and resettled on rented farmlands in Northern Ireland. In the European Alps, alpine glaciers expanded into valleys and threatened the very existence of villages. The Little Ice Age impacted the Americas too. Large segments of Algonquin and Iroquois peoples, for example, left their lands in southeastern Canada and what is today New York for somewhat warmer climes in Ohio and southern Appalachia. By leaving family and loved ones behind, the Shawnee and Cherokee increased the relative carrying capacity of their homelands. In a similar fashion, the 102 Plymouth colonists, which included about 50 farmers and craftsmen hired by the sponsoring London merchants adventurers, sailed across the treacherous waters of the North Atlantic. After enduring an arduous journey, they were blessed to find a bountiful natural environment that offered a respite from the limited resources of the overpopulated lands of Great Britain and coastal Europe. Keep in mind that in warmer and wetter climate epochs or time periods, the carrying capacity of land in coastal areas is increased. Overpopulation, therefore, is a relative concept that is heavily affected by weather and climate. By migrating away from places with too few resources and too few people, natives and pilgrims alike realized miracle number one. They survived the Little Ice Age. Even during the Little Ice Age, storms and hurricanes formed over relatively warm tropical waters. Tropical winds then pushed ocean currents like the Gulf Stream westward, and because of the Coriolis effect, those warm waters fed energy into the northern latitudes. Just like today, there was a hurricane season in the 17th century. Hurricanes made traveling the North Atlantic in late summer and fall a dangerous proposition. For example, a group of 140 Irish Puritans on board a ship named the Eagle's Wing was turned back to the Emerald Isle by a powerful storm, perhaps a hurricane, in September 1636. While the exact dimensions of the Mayflower are not known, the size of other ships built for carrying cargo offer some idea of what it was like for the passengers. The typical ship of that day was about 25 feet wide, 90 to 100 feet long, and displaced about 180 tons. The crew's cabins, or quarters, were located at the bow and stern. The passengers slept on top of their personal belongings in the cargo hold. Ships were leaky, so the passengers were often awakened by icy cold salt water squirting through the ship's planks. For the pilgrims, it took 65 days to cross the Atlantic. Not only were conditions on board the ship physically uncomfortable, the crew members who regularly drank from the ship's sizable store of beer did not share the passengers' austere vision of earthly life. The tight-knit crew of about 20 <clears throat> made the social environment of the passage torturous. That's because the crew routinely mocked and ridiculed the passengers. 
Nevertheless, the overly congested and smelly journey the Mayflower had been previously used to transport wine, so it smelled like a, a bar, really, probably, neared a hopeful conclusion on September 6, 1620, when Captain Christopher Jones spotted the sandy and rocky coastline of Massachusetts. They survived the Atlantic crossing, which was miracle, too. The pilgrims were grateful to God, so they took part in their first Thanksgiving on board the Mayflower. They were led in prayer by William Brewster, who read aloud from Psalm 100, and I quote, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord is God. He is he. It is he who hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Even though the Mayflower had reached the coast of Massachusetts, they arrived in November. Without knowledge of local plants and animals, the colonists and ship's crew had to rely on stores of beer and salted meat and hard biscuits that they had brought with them. During the crossing, hot meals on the ship were rare. Now, being offshore, they were able to secure some water and wood for fuel. Nonetheless, sickness and unsanitary conditions on board ship led to the miserable deaths of about half of the Mayflower's 122 souls. A handful of hardy passengers who were miraculously resistant to the spreading illness took care of the sick among the crew and pilgrims. The craftsmen who had recovered or were not sick set about to find resources on shore. Occasionally, natives would watch the workers, but they would leave when the craftsmen approached them. On March 16, 1621 thereabouts, a young Native American man named Somerset, not Somerset, Somerset, approached the workers and greeted them with broken English. He later explained that he had learned some English by interacting with English fishermen who had cast their nets offshore. Spring was not quite making itself known to the pilgrims, so Somerset offered them some information about the local environment and neighboring tribes. He also introduced them to another Native American named Squantum, or Squanto. Somerset was miracle number three. Squanto was a genuine miracle for the pilgrims. They were a miracle for him as well. Squanto was probably born around 1580. Like St. Patrick, he had been captured by marauding ships and sold into slavery. Whereas Patrick was kidnapped and sold once, Squanto was captured in 1605 and then again in 1614. He made more than two transatlantic crossings. When he was kidnapped in 1614 by an English explorer named Thomas Hunt, Spanish friars rescued him and introduced him to Christianity. The friars then took him to England, where he met and lived with a wealthy merchant named John Slaney. It is believed that Slaney employed Squanto as an interpreter because he sailed to Newfoundland in 1618. After returning to England later that year, he was given passage to his homeland in 1619. When he arrived on Cape Cod, he learned that most of his Pawtuxet band of Wampanoag tribe had been virtually wiped out by a plague. Left alone, he was residing with another band of the tribe when the pilgrims arrived in 1620. Having much better English skills than Somerset, Squanto miraculously used those skills and his knowledge of the English and native worlds to negotiate a six-part peace treaty that Governor William Bradford acknowledged was still in effect some 24 years later when he sat down to write his book entitled A Plymouth Plantation. As Bradford reflected over his colony's experiences and the role played by Squanto, who died 22 years earlier, Bradford was moved to write these words, and I quote, Squanto stayed with them, the colonists, and was their interpreter, and became a special instrument sent of God for their good, beyond their expectation. He showed them how to plant their corn, where to take fish and other commodities, and guided them to unknown places and left them and never left them until he died. In 
As we approach the Thanksgiving holiday, let's not forget that the pilgrims, who routinely faced deadly challenges, often gave thanks to God. Unlike some of us today who think that not having the latest iPhone is an economic inequality and someone else's fault, the miracles of Thanksgiving should give us cause to be thankful for what we have. After all, our poorest communities are much better fed and cared for than anyone living on the shores of Massachusetts in the 17th century. Remember, only a truly grateful heart can be joyful. Happy Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm.